Well, hello and welcome to the second installment of these short courses on structural geology. Uh, today we're going to talk about stress and strain, two very important concepts to have a grasp on when you talk about structural geology because stress and strain are the most important factors in deciding what it is that the structure you're looking at looks like. Um, first off, we're going to talk about stress. Stress is a force. It's defined as your force per unit area. And because of that, we want to talk a little bit about forces. You remember we've got four fundamental forces in the universe. We talk about electromagnetic force, the strong and weak nuclear forces, and what is most apparent to all of us, is the gravitational force, which, um, funny enough, is really actually the smallest in magnitude by proportion. But uh, that's not really important here. Um, Newton also gives us laws of motion that are important when we're talking about forces and bodies. Um, of course, the first law is the law of inertia, and that is that a body will move without acceleration unless it is acted upon by a force. And then he gives us the, um, the relationship of force to mass and acceleration, and that is F equal MA. And then finally, that every action has an equal and opposite reaction. And uh, we want to talk a little bit about different kinds of forces. So you can see here we have body forces versus surface forces. Body forces are exerted by a body and are proportional to the mass of that body, as you can see in this little picture of a falling rock. And as you can see here, when the rock lands, this pushing force of the ground on the rock is a surface force, a force acting on a body. A surface force is capable of accelerating a body or deforming a body, um, and that is different from a body force which is not. Um, now, we want to talk about how stress can be sort of resolved into its vector components, if you remember vectors. Um, I'm sure we've all had a lot of fun with vectors. Not too difficult, but something that you probably have to brush up on before you can just rush back into if you're anything like me. Um, we're not going to get too much into the calculation part of this, but we want to have the concept really straight in our head. So we talk about normal stress and we talk about shear stress. Those are the vector components of stress, because here in this first cartoon, you see the force acting on a plane. So here's our stress. It's the magnitude of the force over your area, which is AB in this little depiction. But if you think about forces acting inside the Earth, they're not usually like this little picture. It's not one force acting perpendicular to one definable plane in a really simple way. Um, so we need vector components so we can deal with the angles of stress and the different stresses that an object can experience from different directions. So we start to use these vector components Normal, if you remember, normal stress is perpendicular to the plane in question. Shear stress here is along the plane in question. These stresses are perpendicular to each other. And this is kind of a 2D resolution. When you get into 3D, it's a lot more complicated. And even though this cube starts to show you what we're talking about, um, you don't usually have perfect cubic orientation in the Earth, do you? You don't expect that stress from this side and this side and this side may necessarily be perpendicular to each other. So how do you resolve that in a, a picture form so you can get an idea of the stress? Well, that is where our stress ellipse comes in and more, even more complex, our stress ellipsoid. Our stress ellipse is a 2D representation. Our ellipsoid is a 3D. Now, if it's not immediately apparent to you, and it wasn't to me, notice the use of an ellipsoid or an ellipse over a square. You see, this can let you orient, and orient a, an infinite number of planes around your axis. In 2D and then in 3D, of course, you have even more orientation options. So you can deal with the the um, stress is acting on a very complex set of planes. Now, of course, you might ask yourself, why an ellipse? Well, it would be a circle if your stress was isotropic. However, it's not usually. But when it is, and it is occasionally, it can be represented by a sphere. Because what these, what these axes represent are your sigma 1, 2, and, and 3, and so on. See here, it's 3 and 3D, and 2 and 2D. Um, and that, those are magnitude. Uh, the reason why this is longer than this is because your sigma 1 direction, and by convention, sigma 1 is always our greatest uh, direction of stress. Well, your sigma 1 
is going to create a longer axis than your sigma 3, which is always your smallest by convention uh, direction of stress. And so it's going to create naturally an ellipse. And the same is going to happen in three dimensions. Um, and we, we use sigma also by convention to talk about stress and uh, our stress straight states, which, like I said, it can be isotropic, but usually it is anisotropic, which means it is not the same magnitude in every direction like you see here. Now, this is not the only way that we can talk about and picture stress. There's another famous way to do it, and I'm sure that if you're taking a structural geology course, you've probably already seen this, and it is the Mohr circle or the Mohr diagram. And this is a way to visualize it in an XY coordinate system. Now, let's take this little picture here and pretend we're doing an experiment where we take a block of wax or clay and we apply some pressure here. That's our sigma 1 because it's the greatest uh, stress, and we apply that to a wood plant and push down, what would we expect to happen? We are going to develop a fracture. Eventually it's going to give way and break. And we take this plane of fracture and we ask ourselves, oops, I don't want to do that. Okay, so we ask ourselves, what is the magnitude of the stress acting on this plane? And we want its vector components. And you see the depiction here. This is the shear stress. This is the normal stress. This plane, plane P, is the plane of fracture. And what is this little angle here? This is the angle that the fracture has created with the direction of sigma 3. And that angle is important when we use the Moore diagram over here. Notice that everything is in terms of our magnitudes of sigma. Now I know this is a little complicated, but honestly, if you think about it, it's a pretty simple way to get a pretty um, interesting and informative picture. So all we need to know is the pressure that we've applied. We can calculate the, the pressure or the stress that exists around the block, that's our sigma 3, and in 2D we can just plot this here. This point P represents the plane that we're talking about, and we get that by marking out 2 theta here, and remember, theta was our angle with sigma 2, so we just take 2 theta, which you can calculate with a, a couple of simple tools, you plot this here. Notice that you've plotted here sigma 1, here sigma 3. Now remember, sigma 1 is always greater than sigma 3. It'll always be to the right of it. And by plotting those two, you've gotten the diameter and thus the radius of the circle. So you just make a nice pretty circle, hopefully better than my circle. And there you go. You've depicted your, your vector components because look at this. Once you have this point, boom, there's your sigma shear. And boom, there's your sigma normal to that plane P. See, this axis is your shear axis. This axis is your normal axis. So the Moore diagram is incredibly helpful. Once you get used to doing it, it's actually very quick. And it's just a useful tool. So do not be afraid of the Moore diagram. Now, before we finish talking about stress, I want to mention our uh, stress trajectories and stress fields. because. This is another interesting way. If you can ever visualize the forces you're talking about, that is a really helpful tool because we work best when we can visualize what's going on. So you can make trajectories of stress here. Now notice these lines represent sigma 1, your greatest stress, your dotted lines represent sigma 3, and this is a block being pushed from left to right. It's experiencing some friction down here along this plane. And it, these trajectories, if you see, they make intuitive sense. You can imagine this block being pushed and the force it experiences. And uh, what is the use of this uh, set of trajectories, which we call, when it's all together, we call that a stress field? Well, that's also going to help you predict your strain. That's your, your fractures, your deformation. You're going to be able to predict that because you know the orientation of your stress in here. Notice it's not homogenous. Um, homogenous, these would be squares, and it would be the same at every, your, your stress would be the same at every point in this block, but it isn't, it's differential, and so your, your strain response is going to be differential as well, and it's useful because you can backtrack, if you start with strain, which is what you usually do in geology, you're looking at a fracture, you can backtrack and say, well, where did this fracture come from? And that brings us to talking about strain. Another word for this is rheology, which is basically the study of rock flowing under stress. And um, there's a lot of terminology here. I've got a lot of pictures to kind of represent the things that we're talking about. Um, elastic and vis viscous behavior are important. And then you have sort of combinations of the two, elastico-viscous and viscoelastic. We talk about homogenous strain, which here is the same um, 
you know, the same throughout, that the rules for strain to have been homogenous, and remember, strain is deformation, is that originally straight lines remain straight, uh, parallel lines remain parallel, and circles will become ellipses. And this is easy to visualize because you can see if this undergoes, say, stress from an overburden, then it's just simply crushed and it goes out the same amount on both sides and everything is sort of predictable. And this uh, heterogeneous strain right here, it's not quite so simple. This is something you can imagine seeing in a shear zone, um, like a transform boundary or something. You can see that this has been pushed this way and this is this way and so what started out as that becomes that. And uh, so it's important to understand the difference so you can understand how this became that when you're looking at that. Um, one really important thing to keep in mind here is that you cannot get a perfectly accurate historical picture of most of the strain you observe because you have incremental strain steps that may not have been linear. Maybe it got squished a little bit to the right and then something happened and it squished a little bit back and then it squished to the right again. You may not be able to see every one of those steps because in the end the rock can become so deformed, possibly partially melted, um, it can be broken up and highly clastic and you never know what you're going to be looking at. You may not be able to know a totally accurate history, but that doesn't mean it's not worth trying to get the best picture you can of what that rock has gone through to bring it from where it was to where it is. And then we just talk about some of the basic terms that we need to know when we're speaking about materials and strain that they undergo. Uh, you have your strength, which is the ability of some material to uh, take stress. Some have more, some have less before they give way or fracture or give in. Um, you've got your brittle behavior, which of course is like a fracture or a break. Uh, most rock at the surface of the earth or in the shallow crust is going to behave brittly. Then you have ductile behavior, which is more flowing, kind of like silly putty. We think of that as something that usually happens at higher temperatures and deeper in the earth at higher pressures. You have elastic behavior. Um, that's important in seismology when you're looking at earthquakes and, and other things where the rock does not undergo permanent deformation. When seismic waves go through a rock, it bounces, it does deform, but bounces right back, and that's called elastic behavior. And then you have plastic behavior, which is more permanent, and that usually happens under uh, ductile flow, you know, um, you've got viscous behavior. Um, and viscous behavior is sort of a high ductility. It's a flow that can be measured and has a strain rate. Um, if you look over here at this little diagram, it gives you an idea of sort of the way, the order in which materials behave. Because under different conditions and different strain rates, different um, stress magnitudes, one rock can behave a, a number of different ways. And so you can see over time and as the strain rate increases how the behavior goes. Because of course a very quick strain rate means that you're more likely to have a fracture. And a very slow strain rate gives you more ability to talk about just sort of flowing along. And so those factors become very important. And some other things that kind of, uh, that were things that affect your rheological behavior anyway. Uh, you could talk about how high pressures kind of, they suppress fracturing, it increases the ductility of your material, it increases the strength of your material, and increases work hardening. And what that means is that the more stress you apply, the stronger the material becomes. And, and um, high temperature, that's going to decrease your elastic component. You're not as likely to bounce back. Suppress fracturing, more ductility, because it reduces the strength of, of the material and decreases work hardening. Um, if you have a very low strain rate, um, you have less of an elastic component, what happens is going to be more permanent. Your ductility is increased, your strength is decreased, and uh, your work hardening is decreased. Now, these are some basic uh, terms and concepts in stress and strain, but it certainly is not the last time we're going to be talking about stress and strain. These diagrams, these ways of measuring and visualizing it, and these terms are going to come up again and again. 
so that about wraps it up for us today, but I will see you next time.